This episode is part of Lanfrica Talks. Lanfrica Talks provides a platform to showcase efforts in language technologies around the world. To learn more or attend our live sessions, see the description below. Good day, everyone, and welcome to Lanfrica Talks episode 21. I am Chris Emezwe, and in this podcast session, we're very honored to have Professor Vukosi Marivet talking with us. Um, Prof. Vukosi has a very extensive bio. He is an associate professor of computer science and holds the ABSA UP Chair of Data Science at the University of Pretoria. He specializes in developing machine learning and artificial intelligence methods to extract insights from data with a particular focus on the intersection of machine learning, AI, natural language processing. Um, his research is dedicated to improving the methods, tools, and av availability of data for local or low resource languages. As the leader of the Data Science for Social Impact Research Group in the Computer Science Department, Prof. Kossi is interested in using data science to solve social challenges. He has further worked on projects related to science, energy, public safety, and utilities, among others. Uh, Prof. Vukosi is a co-founder and CTO of the Lilapa AI, an African startup focused on AI for Africans by Africans. He is a chief investigator on the Masakane NLP project, which aims to develop NLP technologies for African languages. He's also a co-founder of the Deep Learning Endeavor which is the leading grassroots machine learning and artificial intelligence conference on the African continent, which aims to empower and support African researchers and practitioners in the field. We're very honored to have you, Prof. Kossi, and we'll start by um, kicking off with the topic of today's conversation. Um, you telling us what are your thoughts on dealing with data access and data use? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's it's been <laughs> uh, it's been a very interesting, uh, I think, almost eighteen months. If we go back to the beginning of twenty twenty two, and then now we're at the beginning of August in twenty twenty three, and we've seen such like you know big leaps <laughs> in how large models. And and here now large models, whether they're computer vision or or, or, or language, uh, really taking over our uh, kind of our joint spaces in in many many different ways, and a lot of it ends up obviously being driven by uh, this unreasonable march of more and more data. Right, it's almost like you've got this huge machine and it keeps on eating everything, and the more it eats, the more stuff it spits out, and then we get these. Um, AI models on there, but um, given that we're on the African continent, um, and given our, our kind of joint histories with now, let's like you know maybe focus on on language. Uh, given our joint histories with colonialism, with imperialism, it means when we think about our languages and how they are represented in 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 things like uh, like these uh, kind of models, we like you know, see that like you know, see them really lacking. Um, so this doesn't need to be very complicated. You can just go back to the original like translation models, and to build them, you need to have a lot of parallel parallel uh, sentences. How many parallel sentences do you have? Where do they come from? Who's created the content? Becomes a very big thing. So data availability, data access becomes something. But at the same time, I think for a lot of researchers on 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 on, uh, on the continent, or my experience has been that even if you do identify a source that you could use for data, you still need to deal with, hey, um, like you know, copyright um, uh, accessibility. Is it in the right format? Um, and uh, also, this weird thing, like I, I think sometimes we think that the internet is forever. Um, so some people like, you know, will say, hey, you can't get access to X piece of data. 
and then all of a sudden a website disappeared disappears and this website was on like you know an obscure part of the internet that the internet archive doesn't uh, doesn't actually scan <laughs> so you won't actually be available at all in that language um now to complicate things um on on top of that and 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 maybe complicate is the wrong word it's just the reality so the the reality is at the same time with this we we might want to have as much open data as possible. But how then do we answer that question of empowering communities, that communities actually um, can dictate how their information is used? So if we have a language and we then want to make sure that whatever gets developed by AI also represents us well, and also we benefit from it, it might mean saying, hey, we don't, really want our data to easily be available in the internet without actually having safeguards against exploitation with us like you know without us being part of that so it it it, it sometimes is a contradiction because i'm a very big believer in having a lot of open resources uh just because i think it opens up lots of uh, opportunities for people to do research in this area, especially on the African continent, especially by Africans, right, working within these spaces. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I'm a big believer that we should try also to empower people way more than just saying, hey, um, we're building AI, but then people actually understand, um, like, you know, what AI is, uh, how it could be useful for them, and then what rights um, they actually have to their own like you know their own information so so yeah i think that's maybe <laughs> the beginning of this conversation i don't have i don't have complete answers within this i'm it, i think it's still a big big a, a big discussion that is going to go on and i'm willing to learn and i think that's why i agreed also to to have this conversation today yeah thank you very much and uh, i have some follow up questions um going back to uh the point that you raised about the fact that Things don't last forever on the internet, contrary to most people's inherent beliefs. Um, what approaches, what would you recommend for data hosting, knowing that things this may not last forever on this on this website or this platform that I'm hosting it? Yeah, I think it's I guess it's 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 in two pieces. Um the, the way I tend to think about it is um, so I I I I, I really like news for some some reason. <laughs> I think it's been something of like when I think about local languages, I, I always go back to how do people write news in their language? And when when you then think about our local languages, or it, it doesn't really matter, I guess, which uh which country you might be in on the on the continent, what language, you you will then come across community newspapers, just as an example. So community newspapers are are, are really written by people who are very passionate about their language. And their community and they're just trying to make sure like you know that people get information um about themselves or about the communities that they live in uh in their languages on there so it really becomes something where it's run by passion but at the same time it's very precarious so literally in some areas when you ask people for their archives for community newspapers they'll say oh i have physical copies they're sitting somewhere so in the old like you know way of thinking about archiving if you have something that's printed and it's sitting on paper actually as time goes on it starts fading right so that's that will be the one and then you're like okay no but then you have to find a way to actually archive it so which means that it must, might have to be scanned and uh that takes time that takes people that takes money on that one. so so let's actually not even go that far now i host a website and i pay for this website at some domain um, and then i write stuff on there and I also then have copies of my physical thing, maybe in PDF, maybe in Microsoft Word, and they sit on my computer. Now, what does it take to archive that, commu that community newspaper now when it comes to that? What I must have storage uh, to store the PDFs. Um, um, preferably, I should have backups. <laughs> and I should have some way to archive all of the stuff. And literally, we've seen people like say, oh, I just had a, my computer crashed a couple of years ago, and then my 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 catalog is gone. <laughs> right, that's it. Well, um, we stopped really publishing the website that ran for two more years, and then that's it. Yeah. 
Right. So I'm not even talking about like, you know, I know we're talking about subs. Like I've, I've been running my personal website maybe since uh, and I'm going to like reveal my age probably, <laughs> probably since like 2005 or something like that. But it's still like, you know, it means every month I'm paying a host and all those things. And literally if I was to get hit by a bus, you, you know, and then my card yeah. stops working a couple of months from now, my personal website will go away. I don't know when the last time the internet archive archived it or, or, or scanned it, the spider. I think it's it's there, but then it, it's it's mostly written in English. So it's like, you know, it might also be fine. But then for just imagine then you have a, 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 a community newspaper that's written. It's the only one that really writes about a specific community in their language. That switching off in in the, like, you know, in the annals of history, it means that it's almost like, those people didn't exist that language yeah. didn't exist and and that's that is the the thing that uh i think maybe for uh, um the nlp researchers that are out there and 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 in the context of Latin africa and then africa talks is is to also see ourselves as how do we assist such people right to say hey there are ways to do this and we can also start looking at licensing that makes sense for you so there are there are services that are out there where you can upload your archive and still retain control of your copyrights or or whatever. But it's important because yes, later on somebody else might require this beyond the kind of thinking, meaning the, you know, the use that you have right now. And yeah, you 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 need to have it available. Yeah, it's very interesting that you mentioned this because this is the exact um scenario that we had in mind when we were looking at when Africa was looking at data licensing and trying to yeah. provide an avenue for um these these um data creators or people that or farmers as we call them that that do things that have this large data heritage that also yeah. trans translates to the culture and providing a space for them to safely um, share that data with the world and definitely that includes um, creating a license that suits them and not like forcing them to adapt to the existing licenses that are out there yeah yeah that's yeah. And, and 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 in some ways like just like maybe to to, to hammer this point home like literally I've, I've had one interaction with the community uh, newspaper where like yeah uh, the owner's house like floods and that's it. Like, um, yeah, that's... Right, right. It's a, it's like something that is like I think we take for granted. Again, maybe we come from computing and we just think, um, on there, and and on the other side of the spectrum, yeah, um, the the thing of thinking that the thing that you have either on your online storage, um, um, or your cloud service, or that sits on your laptop is actually forever is 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 literally not true, right? We are. In the in, in in the timeline of the universe, we're just a blink, <laughs> right? So that's true. So that's necessarily that you're actually archiving things. It's 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 more that you have it, but then as soon as you're gone and you haven't found ways to, like you know, to to make sure that that's available in a way, like you know, that is accessible in the future, then that's and 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 this brings back even the role and maybe the new roles of things like libraries, where they assist in in curating and archiving these things. So, and and then the thing I like also about Latin Africa is that then it sits as almost like a meta library, right? Because it connects and says, okay, here's the resources where they are, but then we can then kind of now connect to them and help you navigate across these different. Uh, sources of 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 data yeah that's yeah. that's right that's true and coming back to the title of the of this of this conversation so um you, you mentioned tension facing nlp in africa and you yeah. talk about the um the 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 thing of the internet not lasting forever and needing to have that in mind and have these strategies in place you also talk about the kind of um, open sourcing, but how open sourcing is not really the thing that's needed. So 
um, how, how do you how do you see when you talk when you say tension first and end up in Africa? I want to hear from your point of view. Like, where do you see the tension is? Where do you see the opportunities are? And around that that space. Uh, so one, uh, uh, because of of what happened with the large language models and a lot of uh, these large AI generative models, uh, the the discussion about content and who creates content and how people are compensated uh, about that content is becoming bigger and bigger. And and I think this is uh, for for us on the continent has come uh, not as a surprise, but that it was something that was uh, clearly there from the beginning. So if if you um, had worked on something where you were trying to get access uh, to, let's say, images um, in, in your country about specific things and you wanted to ask for them from a service provider, um, they would ask you and say, like, what are you going to do with this? And then at the end of the day, like, oh, we've created this, then there has to be an exchange, right, on them. So now there's the part of, okay, I'm a researcher. Uh, uh, first and foremost, before like you know anything about Lilapa and the um, and the startup world and the commercial world, I, I, I do research, I do science to understand the world, and uh, um, the way that over since two thousand and fifteen, I've really dedicated to understanding the world is through understand and uh, understanding language through computation, right? <laughs> and I think that's what for me natural language processing means is that I'm I'm, I'm trying to to build tools, to build data, to build new methods that can uh, get us to understand ourselves, but then we're using computational methods to do that. So now in, in, the, in the research world, what you would like is to be able to say, I would like to fairly use content that other people have created, they've spent time, they spend their passion on there to do research with on, on there. It's not that I'm going to take that and necessarily resell it to somebody else and say it's mine but I would like to get access to that at, at, on that one. But at the same time, people then view this as saying like, yes, you come in, you take my data, but I don't necessarily see what the benefit it is for me. True, right. yes. So this this then brings up the one, like, you know, I think the first initial tension where you sit down with creators of saying, it's great that you're getting access to these things, you're, you're, you're using a concept of fair use and things like that, but then you, I, I really have to, like, you know, at the end of the day, the scales should be fair. And the, with the large language models, what it's, 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 it's kind of created uh, for a lot of these uh, organizations that are literally just vacuuming the whole internet, where now the other side of the people who create the content are saying that we don't think we're getting a fair deal. And that's why now we're having closures of APIs, APIs now that are supposed to like, you know, hey, they should cost X way more than we're there because we're really in this battle of what's the future of content creation, <laughs> right? Whether it's yes. video, it's audio, it's text and all those things. But I argue that on the African continent, that was, this was clear way before and not, it didn't need to be very complicated that you have an LLM, or you have a huge computer vision generative model. It was just on every time you had an interaction and say, "Oh, it's great! I see you have a, a a like you know a podcast, and in this podcast you are speaking in Isuzulu and all those things. Is there a way for us to work together? I can get extra access to your transcripts and your your thing. I could assist in building something that that does ASR or does um um what does this thing speech generation from text and all those things and the the I'm not saying it's a wrong question. The immediate question would have been like, okay, so I see that you want to do this. I see that this is very important, and I also see that the AI doesn't work without this. What do I get out of it? Yeah, right. <laughs> so addressing the same, yeah, that you, question you, at the beginning, right, right, right at the beginning. But at the same time, as researchers, we're like, no, 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 no. like it, it's it's we 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 have this ticking like you know time bomb that if we don't develop more tools for people to access our languages our languages die mm -hmm. true right so these two things i think are fine like you know are coming to a head and there's this there's this tension that we have on there and we need to navigate it so we we can't go around it so we have to go through it so which means we have to uh, like you know be uh be comfortable with being very uncomfortable yeah 
that's track right. really uh, yeah in, in having these and and bringing the people to the table who are correct and i i don't necessarily think those people are coming from computing they will be coming from the social science from the humanities there'll be people coming from law there'll be people mm-hmm. coming from like you know to 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 really craft these in our image of saying like this is the way that we should be dealing with this if you are in South Africa. This is the way you should deal with if you're in Lesotho, because it takes it takes into account the local context and the expectations that people have about the things that they create. Uh, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, some might argue that having to have these conversations with the creators before doing any 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 data or research stuff some might see it as a as a bottleneck something that takes time and i guess this is probably why for these for the big companies it's better to just scrape the internet than to start going through um having these 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 uncomfortable conversations with the creators to understand with pro quo and what services you're offering them and what they get out of it um how do you like how do you see these the need to have these conversations the need to to think about the context of the community where you're getting the data from so if for example if you're building if you're building if you're building some nlp service and you're using some data from south africa you need to think about the context of the south african community is different from the context of the Ghanaian community so I guess to rephrase the question better is what are some of the challenges you env- you see um, being faced in the approach that the African community has been taking to uh, having these interactions with the use of data? Yeah, so so I think on on one the benefit uh, maybe to be like um, in, in doing things in that way is that you typically get to in the long term, get access to more than what you have gotten access to if if you just like, you know, don't involve um, the people who do the creation, right? Because once they they, they understand what is going on and what the opportunities are um, in, in some ways, they want to get involved. Uh, this is the thing I tend to say about like, you know, for, for me, um, I'd rather spend time demystifying what AI is and getting people to understand what it is than saying and telling them it's complicated, you won't really understand. Because once they they kind of get an intuition, the main points, like, you know, they don't need to, it's the same thing as like, you know, they just need to figure out, oh, here's what AI tries, like, you know, is a, here's our, what AI methods tend to look like. Uh, here's how machine learning works, it needs data. And once they do that, they learn, they're like, oh, okay, I've got, now I've got the language to be able to interact with you. And I can see where the value of one part is and things like that. At the same time, the nice thing about a lot of the machine learning community in, the, in, 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 in like, you know, for the last few decades has been um, this open source um, uh, culture, right? That, um, that it's, it's always kept on coming back. That, the, 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 like, you know, we've, we've had the creation of a lot of um, uh, model frameworks that are open source, uh, sharing of of even now pre-trained models and all those things, and now saying that this can actually be also be part of your process. It could it could add to your craft as a creator, right on there. But you need to understand how it actually works and how it's actually created, so that you are also empowered to say, how do I shape this thing in the way that I would like, right? As opposed to that I'm disconnected from that process. So so there's a there's a part there of of again, maybe the theme of empowering, of of making sure, like you know, it it becomes like you know, just like an eight oh eight synthesizer that I can create with it because I know how to press, like you press the buttons, I I, I know um, uh, how to use the machine. But then once I know that, I can then take my creativity and build on top of what this eight oh eight drum machine is like, right? So you want you want really for them to see the AI and the generative models in 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 the same way. But by having that respectful conversation and going through <laughs> the tension, you then will likely discover that there's way more. And then there's also other things you could be delivering outside just, I've got a new blue score. <laughs> I've got a new, like, you know, uh, F1 score that people will go in and say, like, okay, yeah, yeah, so if you do this and we give you this and you can give us back X, this will be great because there's this other stuff we've been trying to do as well. 
and 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 that's why these conversations actually become interesting and they are very transdisciplinary in nature that's the thing i'm finding more and more and that's the thing i'm enjoying more and more within this this space because now i i, I get to meet obviously different people from different disciplines uh, or different walks of life and and then once we start kind of engaging on that, I, I just go in and say like, okay, now in the future, in my next project, I just need to make sure that we have these types of artifacts because there's people who can actually use these, even though they might not be computational, <laughs> right, mm. in a way, but then somebody else will go like, this is something that's very interesting uh, for us. And then we we we, we do that. Yeah, like, you know, we, we work on those types of things. Yeah, that's a very interesting um, picture that you paint and it's completely different from like the conventional western style of doing research what you paint is not it's it's no longer just the conventional research it's it's research plus community so grounded research if i may where you are not just doing something to put on a paper and publish in a conference and get some citations or some or some stuff for your promotion but you're actually grounding the research to a particular uh, project or community or use case that and um, problem that has real life effect. And this is something that really makes research very interesting, very rewarding yeah. to a human being. Um, on the other side, I can understand how uh, budding researchers and upcoming students who are pressured by the um, the, the the fast um, pace of AI and the need to get promotions and jobs and all that thing, it's kind of a, a bit, might find it a bit pressuring to be able to 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 uh, um, adapt to that kind of research. And it reminds me of some of the work you do in your lab at um, DSFSI, where you work with your students to actually do um, grounded research um, where they're, they're not just writing or well, doing research to have a paper, but actually doing research that affects the communities. Like, for example, there's the, in the work you and your lab did about gathering some data sets around the, the government news. Um, can you tell us some of a bit about, because I know you've done a lot of grounded research like that, but tell us a bit of some of the key works that you've done or sure. works that you remember you're proud of. Sure. Um, and then, okay, I'll, maybe I'll answer this in two parts and say, yes, there's the, um, this is more, the, there's parts that maybe I'll, uh, um, I'll, I will direct at the more senior researchers that are out there. With the senior researchers, yes, we've, we, we like, you know, maybe I, I take myself as one now. I don't know if it's seniority because of, of age or because of work, but we then have a responsibility to use the influence that we have to change um, some of the incentives that are within the system, right? There, there will always be the thing of we we want to make, we want to always push for rigorous science, but then uh, science impact is in more ways than just saying I, I published the paper, right? There's, there's other things that become available on there. And then that requires actually that um, uh, senior researchers uh, um, uh, really blaze, the, blaze the, the path forward, but then also change uh, some some of these things so that the the ones who come after us have a much better environment and that's and and that's in multiple ways as well so some of the reasons that we do a lot of work at at the data science for social impact research group on that on on unearthing data and finding ways to share it is because we want that it's easier for upcoming researchers to just have access to data sets right because then that makes it easy like you know they don't necessarily in some ways have to think about the full thing but then we've used our our influence and our experience to make sure we make things available on there um so yes maybe touching on this government data thing it's very interesting in terms of actually thinking about this and maybe it does illustrate the part of um the the the, the tension so on one part at the beginning when we were doing this is that like you're going to your government uh, government south africa has 12 official languages as of uh, the last month we have a 12th one we used to have 11 uh, now we have 12 uh, that are official um and the new one is south african sign language which is great um that that now we have an, uh, like you know uh, for that and and there could be more um there are projects that i have attempted in the past that I have to keep, uh, like either leave just because we haven't crossed 
some minimum threshold of we can engage with the community well or the community is fully represented. And as such, it just becomes something of, I will pick this up in a year or in two years or in three years. So that's another thing that you have, like, you know, as I said, with seniority that I can make those choices, right? Of saying like, okay, I, don't, I can't do this right now uh, because there's A, B, and C. The community at the moment is still trying to figure out what's the best way to package something. It's fine. And 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 that's the other thing you tell them is that I'm patient. Don't worry. Like you know, I'm not going to push you to do something against your will. Um, with the government one in South Africa, what happens is that the the government communication information service, uh, a system, they publish like a government newspaper twice a month, and it's available in all eleven languages. Um, right. And then in those eleven languages, uh, the more highly resourced languages, they are English and Afrikaans. So you have these nine other languages as well that are not, including my mother's language of Setswana, my father's language of Shitsonga. Now, if in English there's 10 stories, right, they translate like two of them or three of them into the other languages. And this shows you that there's a limit of resources, right? So because they have to get professional translators, and then those translators translate to the rest of the languages. So just imagine that. That's almost like a, a 30% uh, conversion rate, right? But what does this mean? Think about it in a, in a, in, in a very serious manner. It, it means that for all the other communities in the country in South Africa who don't necessarily, for them, English is not the best way to get communicated to, they only get to see 30% of the slice and I just think like it's a practical thing. It's a very, and, and this is a huge thing because it impacts education. It impacts lots of different parts of the government where they'll say, oh, why aren't we translating? Why aren't we making content available for people on there? It literally comes down to it's costly. We don't have the time as well on that one. So what we we then did initially was, like, you know, we, we went uh, to some people within the government and said, hey, it would be great, like, you know, these things are published in PDF. Can we have it in something that's nice, like clear text that allows us to just be able to plug it into a machine learning pipeline? And it was like, you know, we couldn't get anywhere. Um, and another thing I've learned also is that human computation is very interesting. It's, 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 it's very scalable. And when it gets, it gets hit scale, you can do very interesting things without the really going like, oh, I, I need to um, um, only think about the computation, the machine computation. And I think in some ways, some ways uh, things like the Masakani community show this, that human computation can be very, very, very complex and very interesting because you can rely on, oh, we have access to a thousand plus researchers and do something that you wouldn't be able to do if you didn't have access to those thousand humans. So uh, on one in the lab, we said, okay, fine. Uh, we've got these two editions a month that come out um, and they've been running for years. We can do the PDF to TXT conversion, but it's obviously muddled because PDF is not great if you just do a thing, but we can get members of the lab to assist and do the human computation, going through the different editions on all 11 languages, identifying which, which, ones, uh, which page matches to what page and what language, and then from there, cleaning up the TXT file. Wow. And we've now, like, you know, we've done 2022, 2021, 2020, 2019, and we're going backwards, kind of on there. Then once we have that, you already have some great work that have come out of Meta uh, with some of their laser embeddings. So you can even do things like now uh, sentence alignment. So you can ext extract sentences from these articles. After you've extracted sentence, we run sentence alignment, and now you're creating uh, parallel um, uh, pair, pair data for all of the South African language. And now we have 55 different directions you can wow. now build just from uh, kind of kind of that. And now we're also um, creating and, 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 and fixing up the monolingual data sets for it. So you can choose a language and then see all of these, the, the newspapers in, is, as a monolingual data set, and you can check which date. We also try to make sure, again, the thing of who created it. So if there's a, there's a name of the person who wrote the article, their name is acknowledged on there so we keep all of that information like you know th those are people who <laughs> who spend time to create that content so they need to be acknowledged we acknowledge the gcis we put in a disclaimer that we've computationally done stuff to their, to their things and all those and that required us um uh working with our uh, our 
sister or brother lab called the data science law lab at the university which is more on the ip law so they assist us with now thinking about okay how do we make sure we 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 know we respect the content creators we respect their way of viewing copyright and then making sure that people understand uh, the rights and responsibilities that they have towards this data and this is just the beginning there's still things things that we're doing with this data set so you can go to our hugging face and you you soon you'll be get able to get to the uh, the, the 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 parallel um data sets they're already there you can get them but we're trying to make them easier and then to officially become part of the hugging face thing and then hopefully then they'll also make it into land africa and then you'll be able to get to get the monolingual one and there's other sets of other data that i'm saying i can't talk about right now we're still working on and to deal with that will then become available in the same way because the lessons we're learning just from this process we're now applying to other spaces as well and we were then even though there was initially a no from the from the gcis um, department last year they came to visit us a couple of months ago we showed them what we we're able to do showed them uh, our fine tuning of mtm 100 <laughs> um we're using their data and showing them how we could actually then build um translation models even for the languages that were not inside m2m 100 and it was basically after that hey how do we collaborate and now we actually are eagerly collaborating together and as i said you get access to more now they come up with ideas and say like we also want to do x okay. and then we're trying to then figure out we're working on things like misinformation together so our lab has works with them on on them trying to kind of battle misinformation that's a big issue um uh, normally about government uh, governments and, th and things like that and we're now going to be trying to see like what do we give back to them right if does this become hey uh they like you know we 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 can provide some insights into the future of work for translators so how do we bring in um ai people and people who are linguists who work on on ai who can then work with their translators to get them to understand AI tools, how AI tools and things, and how they could be using AI tools to go from 30% of the articles being translated, maybe expanding to 60-70% of the articles being translated. So, so that's the thing on this. Yes, we, we published our paper. That's great. But then we can't leave it at that. We need to, to make sure that people get full benefit from this. And at the end of the day, also, this is data that is paid for by South African taxpayers. So the taxpayer in itself also could should get full value um, and, and uh, out, out of this thing. And yeah, we've released it, people. Um, you can go to our GitHub or go to our the Zenodo. You will find all of these data sets. They are available um, in, in, in there. And, and that's the thing, yeah, that we're really excited about in, in building these types of relationships. Yeah, this that is a truly extraordinary fit and it symbolizes the power of Getting relationships and this idea of this grounded research where you're not just trying to do something for paper, but you're actually trying to do something with a real life um, impact in mind. I also like the like when you talk of value, because sometimes in, in the in the uh, Western and other um the other continents, um we when we think of value, we tend to think of just money. But I like when you talk of value here, it's not just about money, like, you know, how much money you're giving me back in reply, but it's it's about other intrinsic things like helping with a problem and providing a solution with a problem. And it's also not to the extreme of replacing people, uh, you know, as, <laughs> as people go, but it's about, um, um, you know, augmenting the work that people are doing, helping them, hearing what their problems are and then finding solutions that augment them versus not bringing a solution and imposing on them. It's, it's really interesting when we talk of, when we think in of NLP and language technology and even AI in the African context. Um, I think, I think a lot of, there's a lot of uh, misrepresentation of thinking that NLP in Africa is underdeveloped or it's developing. I feel like the West and the, yeah, the West actually have important things to learn from the way language technologies are done in the African context, because it really brings up uh, different, it's a different style of doing something from the way that the, the, the standard way pushes and, and wants everyone to adopt as the way. So it's very, it's I, I very think, beautiful. 
Yeah, I think in the, in the, like maybe it, it's it's worth mentioning that obviously um, um, in, in this part is that yes, there are parts of the world that share very similar histories in, in terms of like the reason I would talk about colonialism and imperialism is that um, uh, the way that we interact with our languages is very much shaped by this history. And, and, and Africa is not the only place in terms of as a continent, uh, you can go uh, uh, to South America, you can go uh, to Oceania and, and all, all, all those parts. And, and we also, even as, as Africans on the continent, we, we have a lot to learn from South America, from Southeast Asia, from Oceania, yeah. from those communities that are also dealing with the same thing in, in that one. I, I've been listening to, uh, like, you know, in New Zealand, what their communities have been doing there. I think um, I'm trying to remember the podcast, the last one, yeah, yeah it's, it's on um, on technology and, and communities and on, um, I, just, I just forgot the name. I'll, I'll try to find it and send it to you. Maybe you can put it in the notes for people to check out. Um, on that one and it's it's very interesting because it's the same like they're dealing with the same thing the tension the tension on t- like it's it's in, uh, it was very interesting because somebody i know um uh who, who's listened to some of my my me like you know my talks then tag somebody else in new zealand and said oh you guys say say the same things you're talking about the same thing and the different continents and on there, and it's like, yes, we have to learn from each other because yeah. uh, we're trying to experiment our way forward, right? We have to figure out that. Like, to, so sitting and saying, well, it's too hard of a problem to resolve, so we'll leave it. Um, it doesn't make sense for us because it it means uh, for us as researchers, not taking our full selves into our work, right? Because then you're saying we're going to erase this part of you <laughs> that is Tonga or Swana because you can't work in those languages so you'll only work in English or you'll only work in French and it's like but there's so much I can give towards making sure that those languages are represented and as such these other problems also have to be solved as part of me doing my work. Yeah that's that's very true I completely agree with that yeah, yeah. um I, I have one moving a little bit back I want to hear your thoughts on open source. Um, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned how, so I paraphrase, but the idea you were saying is that open source may not be, um, many of these communities may not want to open source because they have um, they, they have the different, the concerns and reasons why they don't want to open source. Um, and now around AI, we talk, um, especially in the in the African context, the issue of data sharing and data governance, it's very important. Uh, but sometimes when um, when I talk with some people, um, especially in the the the, the global north, um, open source is always is, is touted as like, oh, just make it open source, and that's the thing. So I kind of. Uh, but then you have the marginalized communities saying open source is not really the solution for us because it's just exacerbating the existing issues. What are your thoughts in terms of open source data sharing and data governance? Sure. And I, I think I, I I will repeat that. Yeah, I don't have the, all the answers here. I, I sit on a couple of other panels or boards where we're, we're dealing with this because in some spaces uh, we're helping fund the creation of data sets. And now we have to go in and say, if we now guide and tell people that the data that they create must be open, there's the part of then who then benefits from that data being open, right? Um, so there's the part of, in 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 general, uh, everybody is benefits, but if, but then specifically, um, if let's say you create a huge video audio content data that becomes available and, and it's very nicely annotated and everything like that. The chances are, as soon as you release it, a very large big tech company with, will, within a few days, if not hours, be able to exploit it and, and then use it for whatever on, on, that, on, on that part. While for a small outfit at, at like you know a small organization or university on the continent, it might take a long time to actually be able to build up the tools that are coming from that that part. And this is the dichotomy of saying like you know, um, open source still is it, 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 it's it is not in a vacuum. It is still within the who has what and who doesn't uh, uh, kind of a root uh, environment. So, we need to make sure that 
we try to make sure that there's some equality and equity within these spaces. And some of it then means thinking about, okay, fine, is it um, gated access or in some way, like some people might think, hey, it's access on you, you, you can only do, like, you know, access and use it if you are also a university, but if you're not, we have to talk. Uh, some, some people um, might think and say like, no, 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 you can access it as long as anything that you derive from it also becomes open. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's all these different mechanisms that, you know, but then for us to be able to even have the conversation about the mechanisms, people must understand the rights that they have. That's true. Right. And, and that also comes with power. So again, I could be at a university in South Africa, more of a seniorish person. I have access to, uh, to funding. I have a lab and all those things. It might be easier for me to make decisions about licenses than somebody who doesn't have the same types of opportunity. Mm -hmm. you see so that that is the thing again that brings up that tension of saying yeah the people who are to tend to have more power and more resources it's easier for them to make these decisions while for the people who don't they might be forced to go one direction or the other and that might not be then at their own like you know with their agreement it might just be they have no choice i see right you see to 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 make those decisions and that's where again we need to uh, um to to figure out where how <laughs> we're, we're we're going to think it, it's been very interesting for me i think last year I spent some time with artists um and they were trying to create like you know how to use ai in their processes and and and, and all those things and you, you you always go back to that thing of like okay this is your thing you're all going to own it at the end of the day how you want to share it you try to like you know, explain to them what their rights are so that they can make a choice that's informed instead of trying to hide it away and just say, yeah, 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 yeah. Just release it under CC0. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not against <laughs> creative Commons. I'm not against any of these things. I'm just explaining yeah. that they need to be, they're not in a vacuum. They have to be taken in context. I see. And last question, uh, because we're almost coming to the end of the session. Uh, yeah. Last question is, um, because you, you're a very seasoned researcher, you've done a lot, you are been in many um, like um, organizations and communities that have really pushed forward um, NLP and language technologies and AI for in the African context. So it's interesting to me and I believe to many of the viewers, what inspired you to venture into AI and NLP? If you can remember like many <laughs> years ago when you started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe NLP is, is more recent in my head. So maybe I'll say that one. Okay. So yeah, so when I was doing my PhD, I was working on reinforcement learning. It was a fun time doing reinforcement learning in like 2009 to 2015 uh, before like the big deep RL stuff really took over. Um, oh. But while I was doing that, I took a class in graph mining. And in that graph mining, what we ended up having, like I having the project I did was to do analysis of Twitter, <laughs> RIP, uh, <laughs> and, and Twitter, uh, analysis of Twitter. And, and, and more it was looking at, there was this phenomenon, this phenomenon happening in South Africa at the time. I was in, living in the US, but this phenomenon happening in South Africa of people watching TV on Twitter. So it became like this very interesting thing of seeing all of these um, interactions. I think I still have it on my, on my website. My website, my blog actually has like a three-part series from then uh, uh, of this class. And, and me then say, okay, fine, I'm gonna download Twitter. They're using all this keyword, which was the, the show was called Intersections and then seeing the interactions that people have around it. But the thing I was doing at the time because I hadn't really worked on any NLP was I was throwing away the text. So I was just keeping who mentions who or who's friends with who. So just looking at the graph, but then throwing away the words. And then the thing I told myself while I was doing that, I was like, okay, fine. I'm not gonna learn this in, during the semester. So um, I have to go back to my reinforcement learning PhD. <laughs> like, you know, I'm just taking taking the class in graph mining um, uh, by Prof. Tina Eliasirad. Uh, I think she's at, uh, what is it now? She's at, is it not Eastern? Yeah. Uh, she, yeah. Um, so I really enjoyed that class and all those things. So I had to 
tell myself, okay, finish this class, finish the semester, go back to my uh, normal day job of, of, of a reinforcement learning researcher, and then one day I'll go back uh, to, to the text. So finish my PhD in 2015. And then when I came back to South Africa, I was like, okay, I want to do data science, but one of the things I have to do is deal with this text that's inside the tweets. <laughs> and very quickly, it became very apparent that as soon as you have to switch away from English, the resources just drop. And that's the thing that really started a, uh, the lab that I have, like, you know, or we have really the, the properly we, because it's, it's really a, like, you know, it comes from that nugget of here's a problem and we need to figure it out. Like at that time I was thinking, why don't we have word to vec and Zulu and is it Gosa and, and all those things. Okay, we're going to have to do it. Oh, to do it, we might have to scrape Isuzulu news, newspapers. Oh, how many Isuzulu newspapers are online? Oh, that's a problem as well. Oh, damn it. Uh, we're being blocked by the website. Or, or like, you know, all these things start adding up and then it's like, okay, fine. As I said, we can't go around it. We're going to have to go through it. So how then do we build the resource? We build things like in doing data augmentation better so that you can you don't need to necessarily have huge amounts of data. Um, uh, new data sets has been another one. Finding ways to improve processes and methods in NLP so that, so all of this comes from that still like, we don't have a lot of resources. We need to figure this out, right? And let's actually make the stuff available to other people so that they can actually have less of this problem uh, on the way. So, so getting to where we are today, even um, uh, my um, contributing, whether it's to Masakani or the deep learning in Daba is really been on for a African researcher, they should face less and less steep learning curves in the space that are created, not necessarily from the computational theoretical space, but just because you're in a space where you don't have access to as much. And by working together, we can kind of create that abundance that all of this stuff is available to you. I, I'm always so amazed by what is coming out of the Masakani community because it's things that 10 years ago, we couldn't imagine. Yeah. Right. That's and that's true. because people are coming and saying, let's create these tools for each other. And then other people build on top of that. Right. Sure. And, and that has an impact because then it means that uh, even other researchers who are not necessarily on the African continent benefit from it because they can now see these new examples. They get access to these other languages that they wouldn't have necessarily worked on. And by doing that, they make more tools available for our languages as well. I see. That's really interesting, your story with the reinforcement learning. I, I'm curious, do you see your um, studying and doing PhD and research in reinforcement learning somehow, um, uh, you know, affecting um, your the work that you've been doing in NLP in any way? Um, so there's a lot that happened during, I guess, my RL PhD, where the reason I started also moving towards data science was this part of reinforcement learning was is a very interesting um, in, in, in as as a uh, as a tool to understand the world, right? Uh, because it's it, it's 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 connected to a lot of um, um, incentive like theory and all those things, and and it, it 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 basically tells us that you can design systems just from learning systems just from being able to say you learn from feedback and you just need a signal for the feedback. And this can then devolve into every other part of machine learning, actually. So the nice thing about reinforcement learning, it's almost like you can think about it as meta-meta learning. So it learns on top of everything else um, on that one. Um, the thing I tried to do, to, to do during my PhD was, how do we make this practical for other people, right? It's great that people can be very much niche in their reinforcement learning world, but there's a there's a switch you need to make in understanding the world and reinforcement learning that is very different to supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And some people find that very steep to change into that thing. So my work was that, okay, how do you make these tools actually easily available to other people who are not reinforcement learning experts? And through that, that's when I get, I guess I got that appreciation of expanding to other communities, making sure that the tooling is... <laughs> 
<laughs> is 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 easier and all those things. And and that's how maybe my history there feeds back into the work that I do right now. Because I'm still thinking in the same way. Right. Mm -hmm. It's great that we're working on this crazy, you know, translation systems, classification systems, and all those things, but there must be nuggets that are in there that can then be taken back to people and make it easier for them to use these things. I see. That's very, very interesting. And yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. So, so yeah, remote learning is nice. I, I still have one student I'm supervising on, on there. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Yeah. But I, I really also enjoy natural language processing. And yes, uh, given everything that's going on right now with um, RLHF and all those things, it might come back. Like, you know, there might be now thinking about this from a perspective of uh, African languages and being able to get uh, signal feedback. Uh, on there we we do have for example on the masakani web tool which is currently down we did try to get feedback on on things like translations and and now thinking about these putting reinforcement learning in the loop might be very interesting to actually then guide um maybe faster um uh, adjustments of of african language translation models or, or things like that and yeah if somebody wants to look at that that i think is a good is like you know might be a good idea in the short term i agree I yeah. totally agree. Okay, yeah. we've come to the end of this um, session. Thank you so much, Prof. Kosi, for taking the time with us to engage in this conversation. It's been a truly yes. interesting uh, discussion. No, no, no problem. 